and do the seafarer, which means we're still on track. Um, Tuesday then we do the Dream of the Rood, and then Thursday we start Beowulf and probably get way behind. <laughs> so, let's pick up with uh, page 68, left-hand column in, if you're using the third edition of the Broadview um, Concise Edition A. Um, and let's pick up with those lines that we very, very briefly um, did the other day, beginning with 106. All is toilsome in the earthly kingdom. The working of weird, actually I don't think we had talked about this. The working of weird changes the world under heaven. Notice what the speaker is saying there. Weird works where? Earth. Earth. Under the heavens, under the skies. That is weird. The speaker seems to be saying, doesn't have any effect out there. Doesn't have any effect on what we today call outer space. They didn't call it outer space. They just called it the heavens. Okay? And then the speaker says, those lines that we did discuss, here, down here, where weird works, um, Catherine, right? Yes. That's okay. That's okay. Just to make sure I got you. Um, here, wealth is fleeting. And we talked about the word that is... I just had it. The word that is used there is manna. Here it's translated fleeting. It's also translated by other translators. Transitory. It can mean lean, or it can mean loan. Okay. Here, wealth is fleeting, transitory, lean, loan, impermanent, changeable, mutable. You can get all those ideas. Okay. Here, friends are fleeting. Why? Because they stab you in the back and move on? Maybe, in which case they're not really friends. What, what is meant by fleeting? Come, they go. Come, they go. They wear out. They don't last. So, money doesn't last, the speaker is saying. That's wealth. Okay? Friends don't last. Why? They die. They die on you. And bear in mind, I mean, we're talking average life expectancy. It's not like, you know, people say, oh, everybody in the Middle Ages died when they were 40. No, we've got all kinds of accounts of a whole bunch of people who lived in their 80s, 90s, early 100s. Real people, etc. But, you know, for a white Anglo-Saxon, I'm not going to throw in Protestant because there weren't any yet, uh, but for a white Anglo-Saxon male, it was 40s and, and you were doing good. Live to your 50s, you were old, okay? So, here wealth is fleeting, here friends are fleeting, here man is fleeting, and that, by that he probably means generally here woman is fleeting, Probably means their women companions, female friendship, etc. But it could also mean here, men die young, women die young. That is, I'm not going to discriminate. If it includes men and it includes women, who does it include? Everybody. All the framework of this worth will stand. And the word the user translates empty is this, idol, idel. If a car, I used this example the other day, if a car is idling, it's not doing what? Moving. It's not fulfilling its purpose, which is not to stand there and just burn gas. It's to go from point A to point B. If a person is idle, the person... The speaker says, we'll stand idle. What's the speaker really saying? It's yeah, it will end, but what else? End as in be destroyed, a whole dramatic myth kind of thing? I don't think so. It will what? It will lack. That is, humanity won't be there. 
Well, then why is it idle? Because then the plants and the animals and the birds and everything, they, they will live and there will be perfect peace and happiness until the tiger's hungry. <laughs> and the sheep goes, meh, and the tiger, you know. That's a gross noise. You know, a tiger's going to do what a tiger does. You know, <laughs> so. Do you think that whole thing on sleeping, sleeping right there that goes back to like that dramatic paganism we talked about of, you know, world ends, we all die, it's the end? Hold that idea till we get to the very end of the poem. And the reason I say that is because some people, some scholars actually suggest the poem should end there. That what comes after that, 111 to 116, that that's added later by a Christian monk. And the Christian monk is trying to Jesify the poem. He's trying to save the poem. Trying to make it Christian. That if you take those lines out, and if you take a little bit out at the beginning of the poem, what do you have? You've got a great 1960s existentialist, angst-filled rant on the uselessness of life. Life sucks and then you die. Get over it. Well, you don't get over it, right? <laughs> if life sucks and then you die, there's no getting over that. I mean, you're stuck there. Yeah, if it's that, then you are in that dramatic mindset. All right? But the poem that we have does have this ending. So said the wise one in his mind. Now, it's like there's a second narrator saying, look at that old geezer over there. This is what he's thinking. And yet, the speaker of these last few lines calls the old geezer what? Wise. He doesn't say, listen to the damn fool rant about how meaningless life is. He says, what he has said is wise. If it's wise, then it's meant to be taken how? Truthfully, seriously, right? Sitting apart in meditation. Notice, sitting apart. Not kind of part of the group. Why is he sitting apart? Because he is in meditation. He's doing what? He's thinking about life. Go back for a moment to... Well, line nine, there is none living to whom I would dare to reveal clearly my heart's thoughts. So what's he doing? He's not revealing it. He's thinking it. So everything we have in this part of a poem, beginning with about line uh, eight, is what the person at the end of the poem says the old guy is thinking. Like he has, you know, a Spockian mind, a Vulcan mind meld. He can actually see, know exactly what this person is thinking. Okay? But that's not the part I was thinking. I was thinking of the part where he says, um, Wretched remembers. He who deeply considers, line 88, with wise thoughts, this foundation and this dark life, old in spirit, What's he doing? He's sitting apart, deeply considering. Sitting apart, deeply thinking about life. Shakespeare has a sonnet that we'll read that begins. When do the sessions of sweet silence thought? I think of thee. Okay. Or I think of, um, think of remembrances of things past. When to the sessions, the sittings, like the court is in session, what does that mean? It means the judge is sitting. Let's get down to business. Okay? The court there refers to the judge, actually. All right? So, when to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I think of remembrances past, etc. The speaker there is saying, when I sit down and I throw myself a really big pity party, and I think about all the old days. The, what phrase, do, what word do we usually put in front of old days? Good. The good old days when things were right, you know. So, 
this guy sitting apart in meditation thinks all this stuff, and whoever the speaker is at this point, he says, he's wise. He is good who keeps his word. And the man who never too quickly uh, shows the anger in his breast, unless he already knows the remedy a noble man can bravely bring about. Well, what was one of the things the wise man said or thought in his heart? Don't make a boast until what? Until you understand. Until you understand what? I mean, you're right. Just keep going. Don't make a boast that, you know, you're going to solve the problem of the national debt. Until what? Until you really understand the magnitude of the national debt. That is, until you have a plan, a real plan. Not some, you know, pie in the sky, oh, we're going to cut government fraud and waste. Yeah, that's going to be like, you pull out a dollar bill. It's like cutting off the little border, the white edge of one part of a dollar bill, and then extrapolate that to millions. How much is that going to cut? Nothing. Okay? So, the wise man, he says who never too quickly shows the anger in his breast unless he already knows the remedy a noble man can bravely bring about. That is, until you can do something about it. What's the old wise man doing? Sitting and thinking. He's not what? Acting. Acting. What is one form of acting? Words. Right? But what speak louder than words? Action. Real action. He's thinking how, how did he put it? He deeply considers with wise thoughts this foundation and this dark life often remembers ancient slaughters and slaughter, uh, etc. And says what? All is toilsome in this earthly kingdom. What does that mean, all is toilsome? This is line 106. It's hard. Life here is hard. Anybody who says it isn't or it shouldn't be hasn't lived. Okay? But what does he not do? He doesn't go out and make a boast and say, I'm going to change the world. Why? He can't. What can he change? Cue the Michael Jackson song. The man in the mirror. Okay. Even Michael Jackson has relevance, you know, in history of English literature. Until he can do what? A nobleman can bravely bring about what? The change that he's kind of seeking. It will be well. Future will be well for one who seeks mercy. How did the poem begin? Always the one alone longs for mercy. Is it longs for? Or is it experiences? Is it awaits? Is it expects? Okay. Notice the nice parallelism there. It's called kind of envelope structure. You open the envelope here, and you close it here. By the way, in case you're curious, J.K. Rowling does this for the Harry Potter novel. Book one, book seven, a lot of parallels. Two and six, three and five, and then four kind of stands on its own. So, it will be well for one who seeks mercy. And then the speaker tells us what that mercy is. Consolation from the Father in heaven. Where for us all stability stands. Well, what has the poem, partially at least, been lamenting? I mean, yes, the death of his Lord, lack of a hall, he's looking for a new hall, he's looking for a new Lord. The death of the Lord and the lack of a hall are part of what? What a time. His past life, what he had, his identity. Go with both of those, past life, the identity he had, notice that's past tense, as opposed to what? The lack of identity he has now? What happened to the identity that he had? It was banana. It was fleeting. It changed, right? 
what he's lamenting throughout the poem is permanence, stability. Because what happens if you live long enough in this world? Everything changes. Everything seemingly goes whoop, upside down. It's happening right now, naturally, geologically. We're not all that much aware of it, unless we're a pilot or something. The North Pole, North Magnetic Pole. We know it moves around, but it seems to really be shifting prominently. Now, about 20 years ago, it used to be under, not the North Pole, it used to be under Northern Newfoundland. Now, the Magnetic North Pole has shifted, it's almost at Greenland. Several hundred mile shift. What does that mean? If it's magnetic, what happens with a compass? It doesn't point to Santa anymore. <laughs> it points to the people in Greenland. Well, that can have all kinds of effects on things like satellites that keep their orbit based upon the geomagnetism of the Earth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In other words, even the poles, because we do know, historically, the North and South Pole have flipped. The magnetic poles have gone from up here to down here several times over the last millions and millions of years. And it might be that it's in the process of doing that, okay? Everything changes. What? Under the heavens. So, what's the speaker really saying? You want real stability, you want real permanence, you, you want to never have to lament the temporality of all things. Look for it where? Not here. Jesus. The Father in heaven. Okay. Look for it there. Why? Because that's where for us, the speaker says, all stability stands. Heaven's hard rock ground. No earthquakes in heaven. Heaven quakes maybe, but no earthquakes. <laughs> it's, it's firm, it's sure. Down here, everything's shaky, the speaker is saying. Right? Is this a one-off kind of poem that is, man, this guy's really weird? Uh-uh. We're going to see some of these same ideas. They're going to come up again and again and again. Okay? So, go to the seafarer. Wander and seafarer are often read as companion pieces. They're not companion pieces in the manuscript. That is, you don't have the wanderer on one page, or one set of pages, and the seafarer right next to it. They're separated. Okay? Usually, in poetry, when you do have companion pieces, they're back to back. I mean, they're right next to each other. So that when, we, for example, if you read Shakespeare's sonnets, many of Shakespeare's sonnets are like that. They're meant to be read as a group. Chaucer apparently wrote the Canterbury Tales that way. He has groupings of tales. How do we know? We've got entire manuscripts, that is manuscripts of all the Canterbury Tales, and yet in some of those manuscripts you have this group of tales that comes before another group or it comes after another group and some. So it's almost like the groups circulated and were copied, etc., etc. Okay? The seafarer is different than the wanderer. The wanderer, from what he's told us, is wandering where, however? Is he on land or water? Water. Specifically, he talks about water. So why isn't he called the seafarer? Is it because the poet says, well, I got another poem for that. It's called the seafarer. Nope. None of these poems are titled in the Old English. Hmm. The titles come from modern editors. But he is called the Erdstapper, Earth Stepper, a wanderer. But just because you're an Earth Stepper doesn't mean you're wandering. After all, Tolkien famously writes about Aragorn, not all who wander are lost. That is, He's not just going, hello, where am I going? It's a Friday, so I... <laughs> He's got an end goal. He knows what his point is. Does the wanderer 
Well, the wanderer kind of tells us. Here's my end goal. Heaven. Okay. What about the seafarer? Now, the seafarer poem that you'll see is much, much more explicitly Christian. I, I told you, you know, a lot of scholars want to read the water. Oh, yeah, good. Anglo-Saxon paganism. Get the Christ, you know, the God stuff out of it. Just live it, leave it with the good Germanic paganism. Life sucks and then you die. You know, be heroic, fight against it, but you're going to die anyways. That's not the seafarer at all. In fact, the seafarer talks about seafaring or his exile almost in this fashion. I'm going to use a Latin word. As a peregrinatio. Anybody know what that means? So every now and then some journalists will try to, you know, prove, you know, they went to an Ivy League school and they'll talk about so-and-so's peregrinations. We'll use a modern English spelling. Pilgrimage. Peregrinatio is a pilgrimage. What do you do when you go on pilgrimage? You go meet pilgrims, right? <laughs> Guys on the, you know, the uh, oatmeal box? <laughs> no. Take a journey for your faith. You take a journey for a religious purpose. That is, you're going to a religious site. Okay? Is the wanderer on a pilgrimage? Of the mind. Of the mind, possibly? Does he arrive somewhere, at least in the mind? A holy site? Don't you get more, any more holy than heaven? I mean, you pretty much, you went, you, you got home, so to speak. That's about as holy as it is. Why? It's where the Trinity dwells. It's where God, what's more holy than being in God's presence, so to speak? Okay? So, the seafarer talks about his seafaring as a pilgrimage. The question becomes, where to? Now, go back to the beginning of the wanderer. What did he say after he discovered his Lord was dead? He sought, line 25, hall sick, a treasure giver, where I might find far and near someone in a meat hall who might know my people, or who would want to comfort me, uh, friendless, accustom me to joy. Can you read the wanderer, quote unquote, I'm using this, the quotes, you know, um, what's the word I want? Intentionally, but not facetiously, allegorically, might he be seeking a different kind of Lord, mm -hmm. one who won't die, <laughs> one that he doesn't have to bury in the ground, one who will accustom him to joy, like eternal joy? everlasting joy, he might be. The seafarer makes it much, much more explicit. So, I can sing a true song of myself, tell of my journeys, how in days of toil I've often suffered troubled times, endured hard heartache, come to know many of care's dwellings on the keel of a ship, terrible tossing of the waves where the anxious night watch Often held me at the ship's stem when it crashes against the cliffs. Notice, by the way, that's all one sentence. Okay. If it's all one sentence, it pretty much has all one idea. What's the idea? Is it, I can sing a song of myself? Um, cue the 19th century Walt Whitman. No. It's about what? It's about the trouble and difficulty of this life. Okay? So, pinched with cold were my feet, bound by frost and cold fetters. Literally, bound, are his feet encased in ice? No, not literally. There might be frost on parts of them. Okay? Where is he? He's not in the Mediterranean. He's not in the Gulf. He is somewhere in the North Atlantic or the Irish Sea, more than likely. And we have numerous accounts of Irish monks and other Anglo-Saxon monks doing this exact same thing. Getting out in a little boat to perform what's called 
and ascetic feet, F-E-A-T, or an ascetic, if you want, contest. It's, it's a practice of asceticism. So if you were an ascetic, what does that mean? Usually only applies to monks. Usually, not always. But it's a, an act of denial. He who would follow me must what, Christ says? Take up his cross and follow me. He must also what? Deny himself. That's the essence of asceticism. Denying oneself. Denying oneself what? All the pleasures of life. So, rather than leaving here and going to a restaurant and getting a really nice, big, fat lunch, having crackers and water, or bread and water, right? Coming up to the season of Lent in the kind of traditional Christian church, what does that mean doing during Lent? You cut back even more than normally, okay? So, he says, his feet are bound in frost, why? The water's cold, his feet are cold. He's not wearing, you know, socks and down booties and all that other kind of stuff. While cares seethe hot around my heart. Feet are freezing cold. My heart what? What do you do when you seethe something? What do you do when you are seething mad? Anybody ever been seething mad before? Or you feel like you could kill? What's the seething? It's boiling. It's boiling over. Okay? You know, cartoons, how is it represented? Steam coming out of both ears. Okay? His heart was what? Seed hot with cares. So, feet are freezing, but he's got problems. And hunger gnawed my sea-weary mind. So he's hungry, he's bothered with problems, and his feet are cold. So why doesn't he do something about his feet? Is it part of the asceticism? He has to suffer? So every now and then he takes his shirt off and gets a whip and chains and you know, beats himself like some monks did in the Middle Ages in the Western Church? Okay? No. You've all had this same experience. Not necessarily where your feet have been freezing cold, but where you, quote unquote, deny some part of your body, some aspect of your body. Why? Because you are so preoccupied. You, you forget to eat because you've been studying so much. Okay? You forget to do something. Why? Because you're not here. <laughs> you've checked out. You've gone somewhere else. I see it often in classes, you know. I'll look at somebody, and the eyes are glazed over, and, it, you know, it's kind of like, ooh. <laughs> Doesn't happen as often in mine, because I'm usually pretty loud. But I've walked by, I can't tell you how many classes, of one of my colleagues, and this, this person's just monotone. Just straight monotone. Like a bagpipe drum. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll walk by, and faces will be, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <clears throat> that man does not know <coughs> what man this one he whose lot is fairest on land does not know what how I dwelt all winter wretched with care on the ice cold sea in the paths of exile deprived of dear kinsmen now, does he mean literally all winter? Might. He might mean I spent three months at sea. And who doesn't know? Who, does, who hasn't experienced that? Is he saying everybody who's fat, dumb, and happy on land? No. That man whose lot is fairest on land. Take your pick. Somebody give a name. Whose lot is fairest on land in the United States of America today. Who's got it made? Everybody's. 
Jeffrey Bezos, except his wife's going to take yeah. him for everything. <laughs> Only half. Or maybe half. You know? <laughs> but, you know, no prenup, so <laughs> he can afford the lawyers better than she can, I guess. Okay? Bezos, you know, probably one. Um, Bill Gates, probably be up there too, right? Okay? So, why do they not know? Because they've not done what this speaker has done. Deprived of dear kinsmen, and your gloss tells you, might be something wrong with the poem there. There might be something missing, not quite sure. No break in the manuscript, but it doesn't make sense as it is. Um, hung with icicles of frost while hail flew in jars. Why is the speaker hanging with icicles of frost? How many of you saw the movie with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, Hunter, Bear and all that, yeah, the Revenant one. Yeah. You saw pictures of him with his beard, you know, and icicles hanging from it. Right? We're getting ready for a cold snap. Beginning of next week. Beginning middle of next week. We're going to have three or four days sub-freezing temperatures all day. And lows, low teens. Well, if I were to, you know, take a shower, not draw off my beard, and go outside for 10, 15 minutes, it would turn to ice. My kids think it's cool. <laughs> Sit there with squirt guns, you know. <clears throat> or they used to. <clears throat> so, hung with icicles while hail flew in the showers. I heard nothing there but the noise of the sea, the ice cold waves. So, his only companion is whoosh, 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 sound of the waves. The wild swan's song, sometimes served for music. What else? The gannets call and the curlews cry for the laughter of men. So what is he extrapolating to his life on the sea? It's kind of like what? The hall for those back on land. Okay? The swan becomes what? The sound of the harp, the gannet, and the curlew become the song of a singer. We're told, and the seagulls singing for mead drink. Kind of like the clanging of tankards, if you want. He's by himself, but with the swan, the curlew, the gannet, and the seagull, it, I, it's kind of like I have my friends around me. Eerily similar to the wanderer, right? What's the difference? This speaker is aware. These are birds. The birds make noise. I'm kind of taking their noise from being this. When the wanderer has that happen, he's hallucinating. He sees the birds, and what does he see? Fred, George, <laughs> Harry, Hermione, Ron. <laughs> kind of like Mrs. Weasley when she sees them all lying dead on the floor, you know. <laughs> Arthur, etc. <laughs> so, storms beat the stone cliffs. The turn, another bird. The turn answered, icy feather. The eagle screamed, dewy feathered. No sheltering family could bring consolation to my desolate soul. I don't have a family to console me, he says. Birds won't cut it. Probably cats wouldn't cut it. Dogs wouldn't cut it. Why? Not human. And so, the old English there, your gloss tells you, is the word forethought. It's used throughout this poem. And it can mean different things depending upon the context. It can mean and so, it can mean therefore, it can mean because, it can mean thus. Okay? When I used to teach um, old English, one of the poems we translate, Students would start getting to the fourth thoughts here, and they're like, what the hell does it mean? How do I know which one it is? And I'd you know, say, plug them all in. Plug everyone in and translate and see which one kind of works the best. It's not that there's necessarily a single one, okay? So, he who has tasted life's joys in towns, your Bezos's, your Gates's, etc., as well as us, what? Suffered few sad journeys. Well, maybe that doesn't include us. Or maybe that doesn't include you. Okay? 
he he might not necessarily mean few sad journeys like he was trying to get from London to Oxford and he got robbed on the way. That's a sad journey. Or he's trying to get from Murfreesboro to Atlanta and his car broke down. That would be a sad journey. I could say, yeah, many of those. <laughs> so, the one who's had an easy life in town, who has had few sad journeys, scarcely believes. Why? Okay. But he's talking about the person who hasn't seemingly had his faith tested. If you want to, okay. Why not? Life's gone swimmingly. Life's gone person, perfect for this person. But he's not. He doesn't necessarily mean believe their belief as in faith. Scarcely believes what? Proud and puffed up with wine. What I weary have often had to endure. Why doesn't this kind of person believe the seafarer? Because they've never had to endure it themselves. Never experienced it him or herself. Here guys come back, here soldiers, men and women, come back from battle and listen to them discuss it. And some people say, no, nah, couldn't have been that. I like, shut the hell up. <laughs> Don't tell me what I didn't experience. Okay? They can't believe it. Why? Because they are, the speaker says, proud and puffed up with wine. Puffed up with wine means what? Drunk. We're going to see the exact same phrase in Beowulf. A character will be described as puffed up with wine. And Beowulf means by that, drunk as a skunk. I mean, just dead to the world, almost. But still not passed out, but almost. What I've had to endure in my seafarer. In other words, I could tell you stories. Oh, I could tell you stories. The night shadow darkened. Nicht Shua is the Old English. Night shadow means the darkness of the darkness. It got really dark. Snow came from the north. Frost bound the ground. Hail fell on earth. So it's night, it's snowing, it's hailing at the same time. Coldest of grains. Forth on. And so they compel me now. What's the they? We get in a positive. My heart thoughts. Heart thoughts, not mind thoughts. What's the difference between mind thought and heart thought? Logic versus emotion. Logic versus emotion? What else? So if it's emotion, does that mean right and wrong? What do people often tell you to do if you have a major decision coming up? Sleep on it. Follow your heart. Trust your gut. Trust your gut. This is not this. The gut is not the mind. So why trust your gut? Why not reason it all through? Because what do we what do we sometimes say about the mind? It plays tricks on us. Lavandria is like. Seeing things that I don't see. <laughs> it's some flu by and I'm stuck in. It's like, whoa, the whole world's opened up. <laughs> okay. His heart thoughts compel him. To compel means force, urge. Doesn't have a choice. Okay. To do what? To try for myself the high seas. What do you do when you try something? What's another verb for try in that context? Test. Test? Attempt. 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 Another one? Starts with P. Prove. Both of these, in fact, this one too, this is all language. <coughs> See, these are the modern English. I don't remember what the old English is. Um, all three of those terms, modern English, come from medieval alchemy. What's the goal of medieval alchemy? Turn gold, turn gold, turn lead into gold, and to come up with the elixir of life. But they're not literally about getting gold from lead or coming up with the elixir of life. 
They're about transformation. They're about turning base, common, material things into noble, pure, immaterial things. So, to try for myself the high seas. That is, to try myself on the high seas. What's he doing? He's proving himself. He's testing himself. What do you do when you prove something? You remove from the thing certain other things. It's refining. It's purifying myself on the high seas. What do I really, really, really need? What do you really, really, really need to live? You don't need these. We don't. I don't really, really need these. Helps. Okay. With our climate, I do really, really need these. Otherwise, I'd freeze to death. Or I need a house. What you know, the basic necessities are what? Shelter, food, water. That's it. What does he have? If he's on the high seas, he doesn't necessarily have water. Why? Go swimming in the ocean and take a mouthful. He can't drink it. But what does he have from the ocean? The food. The fish. Doesn't sound like he's doing so well in the shelter aspect. But maybe he has some. It's raining. There's your water. So he's going to prove himself on the high seas, the tossing salt streams. My heart's desire urges my spirit time and again to travel so that I might seek, and we get the first indication of what he's seeking, a foreign land somewhere far from here. Why would he seek a foreign land somewhere far from here? What's so bad about here? Prior to the um, prior to the 2016 election, I don't care what your politics are. Prior to the 26 elect, 2016 election, you had groups on this side and groups on this side both saying, "If so and so is elected, I'm leaving. If he's elected, I'm going to Canada. If she's elected, I'm going to Canada." It's not necessarily that Canada's all that much better. So the idea was. This was going to become so untenable, so unbearable. So what's so bad about the world that this speaker says, or this land, that the speaker says, I'm going to find somewhere else to live? We don't know yet. And so, no man on earth is so proud in spirit. This is a gnomic passage, by the way. Remember, proverb, it's a wise saying. Nor so gifted in grace, nor so keen in youth, nor so bold in deeds, nor so beloved of his Lord. Notice all those statements. There is no one on the earth, he means the whole world, who is so proud in spirit, haughty, arrogant, if you want, who is so gifted in grace, who has received such grace. Now, that's not necessarily theological grace. That is possibly natural talents and abilities. Okay? nor so keen, that is, sharp-edged in youth, nor bold in deeds, has a big, long resume full of a lot of stuff that he's done, nor so beloved of his Lord, well-loved of his Lord, that what? That he never has sorrow over his seafaring. Now, is he talking about literal seafaring? No, he is not. What's he talking about? What journey? Life. One step, one foot in front of the other. Walking out that door and seeing what life has to offer you today. Because most of you, one hopes, you'll walk out of that class and you'll go about the rest of your day and it'll be a great day. But some of us, it might have started off sucky and it just gets worse. You had to come to this stupid class and listen to this stupid old English literature and then you go from here and you have to go to another stupid class and then you have to go to your stupid job and your life is stupid and you know <clears throat> then you die. <laughs> <laughs> he has no thought oh excuse me back up. He never has sorrow over his seafaring. 
comma. So everything I just said, comma, there's something else we have to add to it. When he sees what the Lord might, oh, shut up, Siri, what the Lord might have in store for him. Okay? What does that clause do for everything that came before it? It's not so bad. If what? If you see what the Lord has in store. Well, when? When you die. Not tomorrow. Not the next day. Not next year. Not next 20 years. Not for you guys next 40, 50, 60, 70 years. For most. I'm assuming everybody in here is going to live to a ripe, happy old age, etc. Okay? When he says that he never has sorrow over his seed fairy, what's he mean? The psalmist says, Mourning will be turned into joy. Romans says, Paul says in the book of Romans, that for all those who love God, everything works out in the end. That is, what appears to be sorrow, what appears to be sadness, now will actually turn out to be joy. Doesn't mean that at this very moment, it's not sorrow. It's just looked back upon. And I bet everybody in this room can look back upon something that when it happened, you thought, man, that really sucked. And yet now you go, sure, I'm glad I got out of that relationship. Ooh, that was a bad one, you know. Or class, whatever. <laughs> As people flock to the door. <laughs> so, Lord, the Lord, not a Lord. The poem has just leapt from here and now, everyday ordinary, to allegory. Okay? He ain't talking about some earthly Lord. He's talking about the heavenly Lord. He has no thought. That is, the one who thinks, who sees what the Lord has in store for him. That person, he doesn't care about the harp or the taking of rings. Well, remember we talked about, you know, the Germanic society and the relationship between the Lord, the chieftain, and the thane. What's the relationship? I scratch your back, you scratch mine. I fight your wars, you give me treasure. Um, no thought of the taking of rings. That is treasure. Well, let's extrapolate or let's update to today. He has no thought of what? Money. It's not just money. A little more than that. It's kind of like a salary increase, a raise. You've been slogging along, slogging along at the same job, minimum wage, maybe two, three years. Other people are getting raises. Okay, they might be only 10 or 15 cents an hour, but hey, a raise is a raise. And you're not getting it. If you think of, you know, the, the big picture, the speaker is saying, you don't worry about that. Okay. So you don't think about the harp, singing, think Cadman, or the taking of rings, nor the pleasures of women, nor joy in the world, pretty much tells us, Anglo-Saxon times, it's a male writer, it's a monk, okay, so. so you don't think of pleasures of women, sex, nor joy in the world, right, because women aren't the only joy, in the, what other kinds of joy are there? What comes before women in song? Wine, <laughs> beer, parties, etc., nor anything else but the tumbling waves. If you look long term for what the, what the Lord, notice, might have in store for him. Might also means might not. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about Calvinism when we get up to the 17th century. He what? He doesn't think of anything but the tumbling waves. What are the tumbling waves? Struggles of life. Struggles of life. Right? How many of you is your life's journey, so to speak, like this? 
rising because it's progressing. It's getting better and better and better. Today was better than yesterday, and tomorrow will be better than today. And yesterday was better than the day before. If you want to leave, because I can't control it. <laughs> or you come up here and teach the rest of us, because it's not my experience. Because what is life generally like? It ought to be like an EKG. <laughs> you go up and you go down. You go up and you go down. Right? Because what happens when you're like this? Yeah. <laughs> I like responsive classes. <laughs> okay? The tumbling waves. But within the context of the tale or of the poem, he's talking about the waves of the sea. The sea is life's journey. He who hastens to see always has longing. Longing for what? What is that desire for? I mean, it's, it's not as simple as, well, you get on a boat, you go out to the sea, and you come back home. It's the longing to go out to the sea for what? To find. find home. Jesus, somewhere, I don't remember where, talking to one of his followers, I think it's Nicodemus, and tells him, where's the kingdom of heaven to be found? In here. It's not out there. Okay? What did the, some of his followers thought, you know, Palm Sunday, what, what happened when Jesus entered Jerusalem during Palm Sunday? People threw down their coats and threw down palm leaves. They cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's code language. We hear all kinds of stuff about code language today. Like wearing a MAGA hat, you know, that's code for being a racist and homophobe and all this kind of stuff. Well, blessed is he who comes in, that's code for it's the Son of God. <laughs> it's the Messiah. Okay? And yet what happened? Nope. Why? Get strung up on a cross seven days later. Or three, four days later. Couldn't be. Couldn't be the son of David because David was a badass king who, you know, defeated everybody. How come he's not defeating everybody? Different kind of king. Okay? So, when he says, he who hastens to see always has longing, has longing for what? He's trying to get home. Where's home? We have a phrase today. Home is what? Where the heart is. Where the heart is. But I know a lot of people, home's not like that. Home's a hellish place. That is, their heart isn't what we think of as home. You know, four walls and an address, so to speak. What is home really? The idea of home or ideal home. It's where you can what? Feel safe. Feel safe? Belong. 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 What else? Comfortable. Comfortable. These all are part of what? They all relate to one larger idea. Where you are accepted. Period. The real ideal home is where none of us put on what? Masks. Because every one of us would wear a mask, right? You come into this room, and what kind of mask are you wearing? Student mask. I come in here, I'm professor mask. I leave here, I go home, slob mask. You know, I talk to my kids, you know, authoritarian mask. I talk to my cat that I want to kill, man murderer cat, you know, mask, etc., etc. Okay? This, no masks. No masks at all. Okay? It's that longing for, <sighs> can I just be myself? So, he goes on and says, leaving the sea, <coughs> talking back of land now, because he's drawn a, a distinction between those on the sea and those on land. The groves take blossom. 
Not yet. But give about a month and a half. And what's going to happen with these trees out here? They're going to burst into leaf. Okay? The cities grow fair. They get bigger. They get more prosperous. More people move to them. Some people think of that as progress. I think of that as hell. <laughs> I mean, I fled California with, you know, a million and a half people in the city I lived in. And now Murfreesboro is becoming just like it. <laughs> Pretty soon I'll be out beyond Woodbury or <laughs> Idaho or something. Anyways, so the cities grow fair. The fields brighten. The world rushes on. The fields brighten. That's different than the groves, you know, um, take blossom. What has just happened? Time. Spring, summer, fall. The fields brighten. Everything's ready for harvest. Time rushes on. All of these. He's saying each of these seasons. Or all the seasons together do what? They urge the eager-hearted spirit to travel. When one intends to journey far over the floodways. Spring's a good time to start that journey. Summer's a good time to start that journey. Fall is a good time to start that journey. When's a good time to start that journey? Now. Now. Okay? Even the cuckoo urges with its sad voice. Summer's guardian announces sorrow. He's saying the cuckoo tells us what? Winter's coming. You better get ready. Read um, Shelley, Ode to the West Wind. Shelley? Keats. Shelley. <laughs> Shelley Keats. Shelley. Read Shelley's. Is that Shelley's or Thank you. I always get them confused. I just taught it, you know, last semester. Um, about. What the west wind portends. If winter be near, excuse me, if winter become, spring is not far behind. What's the idea there? After every death, there's a new birth or rebirth, if you want. So he does not know who, the man blessed with ease. What those endure who walk most widely in the paths of exile. Well, who are those who walk widely in the paths of exile? He's not just talking about pilgrims. People who get up and leave their homes. What can the path of exile be? Could be going out on your own. Can you do the path of exile with everybody around you? Can you practice this in the city? What does this involve? Self-denial. That's it. Can you deny yourself at McDonald's when there are other people all around you? They're eating Big Macs. What can you do? Can. Not do you have to. You can not have a Big Mac. You can have just a burger. That's a denial, right? It's not the same as everybody else. Right? You know, people make a big hullabaloo and cry, you know, you can't have any prayer in public spaces, blah, blah, blah. Really? Really? Do you have stormtroopers coming and killing people because they cross themselves? No. You can pray anywhere and everywhere you want. You might not be able to stand up on a podium and do it. And we could talk about the politics of that if you want, but I don't want to. <laughs> but what's he saying? He's saying this journey does not necessarily have to be where I go off on my own, on my own. And by the way, the, all the language about the water and seafaring here, it's because when the idea of monasticism is brought to Anglo-Saxon England, they transfer an idea from where monasticism began. Monasticism began in the 4th century in Egypt. And the idea there was to get away from people, to go off on your journey, what do you do? Go into the desert. Going on the ocean was the Anglo-Saxon idea of going into the desert. Okay? But we got monks from the 4th century who say, you don't really have to go anywhere to go into the desert. 
you can go into the desert right where you are by simply denying yourself certain things, certain pleasure, etc., etc. Okay? So, he says, and so now my thought flies out from my breast. We've got 24 minutes, 24, 25. My thought flies out from my breast. My spirit moves with the sea flood, roams widely over the whale's home. He's in a boat, and it's kind of like he's doing this astral projection stuff, you know, sending his spirit out over the waters and such to the corners of the earth, and it comes back to him greedy and hungry. What's the image also from? What does Noah do? The flood comes. Noah and his family, they're on the ark. Water stops. Rain stops. After a while, Noah sends out a bird. The bird comes back. Why? Nowhere to land. He does it two more times. I think it's the third time. It doesn't come back. Second time, it brings back an olive branch. Twig. Meaning, land's starting to show again. Third time, it found land. That's the assumption. Maybe you die. <laughs> <clears throat> so, sends his spirit out, it comes back. The lone flyer cries out, incites my heart ir uh, irresistibly to the whale's path. The whale's path is a kinning. Um, I think this one is Hualarad, right? It's either Hualarad or Hrum. It's a kinning. A kinning is an Anglo-Saxon poetic um, figure of speech, like a metaphor, if you will. But it's different than a metaphor in that a metaphor is pretty easy, right? You compare two things without using a, a comparative word. Fast as a tiger, the as makes it a simile. He's a tiger. That's a metaphor. Here's the difference between that and a kinning. A kinning is a metaphor of a metaphor. So he's a tiger. Now find another metaphor that describes that. We can't really do it in modern English. We've completely lost the ability to do this. They loved these things. And Anglo-Saxon kinnings are relatively easy. Okay? You have another one used in Beowulf. Diarrhea. Day red. Morning or dawn. Why? It's when the day's red. Okay. Um, Old Norse had much, much more developed kinnings. There's this one in this Old Norse poem. When I took Old English um, as a doctoral student, I took Old English in the fall, had Beowulf in the spring. Same time I was taking Beowulf, I was doing an independent study. Um, of Old Norse at the same time. So I was getting my stuff all screwed up. But read this one poem in Old Norse, and there's about seven or eight lines in Old Norse poetry, and they all describe memory. It's a whole long passage. It's like in the cabin, in the floating back room of the ship of my mind, a but, 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 but. Okay? So it's a kidding. So what does he mean? It incites my heart irresistibly to the whale's path. The, what's the path of the whale? It's the ocean. Okay? Over the open sea. Why? Because hotter to me are the joys of the Lord than this dead life. Hotter. Hotter. Why describe the joys of the Lord as more hot or hotter? Freezing on the ocean. So he could do what he wants. It's freezing on the ocean. Okay. Why else? Let me use a really, really, by the way, it's sexist. sexist term. He's hot. She's hot. What does that mean? Appealing. Desirable. Okay. That hotness factor, that is, it incites. It kind of awakens something. The joys of the Lord, he says, do what? Inflame. They... Draw me than this dead life. But the speaker's not dead. The speaker's still breathing. So why is this life dead? So 
I don't care anymore. <laughs> Lana, 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 Lana. It's all loaned. And if it's loaned, you got to pay it back. And if you got to pay it back, it ends. Here, at least. Okay? Loaned on land. Loaned. It's given for a time. It's got to be returned. Your gloss. This dead life loaned on land. At this point, the sea voyage is revealed to be a journey of spiritual discovery. Actually, I don't think it's necessarily at this point. I think that came a little bit earlier in the poem. Okay. In your editor, um, translator, uh, Leuza mentions, you know, the Latin voyage of St. Brendan as an example. Well, according to, you know, the voyage of St. Brendan, St. Brendan went off, left the Ireland, and found heaven. Okay. Other people, fantasy writers, have taken this kind of motif and such. It's, it's kind of the basis behind Tolkien's. You could leave Middle Earth and sail off and find Valinor. Okay, that's the ultimate pilgrimage, so to speak. So, I will never believe that earthly goods will endure forever. Always, for everyone. No matter who you are. No matter how much body transformation stuff Jeff Bezos tries. I don't know if you've read much about Jeff Bezos. The guy is scary, man. He is just, he's out there scary. He, you know, transhumanism, him putting robotic parts, cyborg and he wants to live forever. Okay? That earthly goods will endure. Always, forever, and one of three things hangs in the balance. Okay? Before it's due time. That is, before the promissory note is due. Here are the three things. Illness, or age, or attacked by the sword. Rest life away from one doomed to die. We all gotta die. It might be from illness. It might be from old age, or it might be from attack by the sword. Okay, so we don't have many sword killings today. <laughs> so what might that be? It might be an attack by a handgun. It might be an automobile accident. It might be something like that. In other words, we all die. Even old age counts in there. So, and so for every man, the praise of posterity, those coming after is the best eulogy. What's he really mean by that? What does everybody, at least in Western civilization, I, I, would, I think it's safe to say, what does everybody want the world to know after you are dead? What do you mean? That you'll be remembered. That is, you existed. You did something. Might not be major, might not be important, but you existed. You don't want to be forgotten. What's the name of the Disney film just came out? Last year or so? It's about the Day of the Dead in Coco. 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 Sucker hit me between the eyes. My mom, <laughs> died of, my mom died of Alzheimer's a couple of years ago. Okay. Alzheimer's does what? It takes your memories away. Well, what happens in that film? If you are no longer remembered, you disappear. And you can't come back. Because you really disappear. So, the best eulogy? By those who remember you. The speaker says. That, so how do you get people to remember you? Louder? You have kids, that's one way. Shakespeare's going to talk about that in the sonnets. You influence others. You guys are all too nice. A bunch of nice, moral people. <laughs> what about be Hitler? Be Genghis Khan. Be Stalin. Be Pol Pot. Depending upon your politics, be George Bush. You know. Be Donald Trump. Be Barack Obama. Be... Because we're not going to forget Hitler for a while, right? I mean, we haven't forgotten Charlemagne. <laughs> we haven't forgotten Caesar. We haven't forgotten some of those guys who've been around a long, long time. So, 
that before he go on his way, he act bravely on earth. See, but it's, you were right, you good moral people. It's not doing bad things. <laughs> Sorry, that was my talk on existentialism and nihilism coming in. You act bravely on earth against the enemy's, plural, malice. Well, who are the enemies? Is it just Satan and all his henchmen? Maybe. Do bold deeds to beat the devil. How do you do bold deeds to beat the devil? You put on your boxing gloves and go, yo, Satan, come here, man. <laughs> or you whip out your sword. Or, you know, which is it? Swallow the red pill or the blue pill and go all matrixy on them? <laughs> Is this how you do bold deeds to beat the devil? Because within the Christian tradition, what does the devil say? Amen. He's devil. Devil's really good. Ooh, she's cute. Go after Ooh, he's hot. Go get some. <laughs> and this says, no, I, I want to, but no. <laughs> or, yeah, I can eat that piece of cake, too, or that cake, too, or I can drink another five beers, or... So, do bold deeds to beat the devil, so the sons of men will salute him afterwards. The him isn't the devil. The sons of men will salute whom afterwards? The person who did the bold deeds to beat the devil. They will say, afterwards done good. He lived a good life. He did well. Okay, That's why you will get a eulogy, a beautiful word, and not a dislogy, a horrible word. I imagine if Hitler were to still be alive, if we discovered that Hitler actually wasn't dead, and he was still alive today, and he were to be discovered, found out, executed, I doubt that there is a single person who would deliver a eulogy. And I take that back. There's probably some wacko Nazi somewhere who would. But most people would deliver what? All kinds of dislogies. Right? When, when Osama bin Laden was caught and killed, drove me nuts, my own religious, spiritual philosophical, political views coming out of it, drove me nuts when Mike Huckabee said, burn in hell. And there were parties in the United States. Why? There's one person dead, okay. Yeah, responsible for 9-11, all that, sure. But my own religious, spiritual tradition, all that kind of says, one thing, at least, about everybody, everybody in the Judeo-Christian system, idea, is made in the image of God. Yeah, even somebody like Bin Laden. Screws it up, puts a lot of mud on his face, the image is still there. The speaker here is telling us what? You want that image to be praised after your death. So, do good deeds, don't do those bad deeds. And it's praised thereafter, so you will get the salute from men. Men will say, well done. You will also get what? The praise of angels. His praise thereafter live with the angels forever and ever in the joy of eternal life. Delight among heaven's hosts. Shouldn't it end there? I mean, that's a, think about it rhetorically. That's a great ending place. <laughs> live your life so that when you die, the angels go, way to go. Come up here, you know. Take the big reward, the car, the girl, you know, the, it's like the game show of life, so to speak, right? <laughs> but he doesn't. What does the speaker then do? The days are lost. And all the pomp of this earthly kingdom. What does that really mean? The days are lost and all the pomp, all the ceremony, all the splendor, all the glory of this earthly kingdom. Modern phrase, life sucks and then you die. We're back. We're back. <laughs> the days are lost really means what? Time's up. Time's up. Tells you, 
hold on, I got to go take care of. Read Emily Dickinson's Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Because I Could Not Stop for Death, He Kindly Stopped for Me. Think about that. I mean, that is so profound. I was too busy to die. So, death came and knocked on my door. He showed up in a carriage and said, um, come on, <laughs> got a little journey to make. You don't get to choose, right? I mean, you could get all philosophical and say, yeah, even somebody who commits suicide didn't really choose. It's just their time was up. <laughs> okay? There are now neither kings nor emperors nor gold givers as there once were. When they did the greatest glorious deeds and lived in most lordly fame. Extrapolate or update that to now. There are now not what? Congressmen and women, presidents, etc. As there once were. We're getting up in a couple of weeks. Getting ready to celebrate President's Day. Idiotic term. Really, should we celebrate all of our presidents? Hell no. <laughs> what did it used to be? We had two holidays. We had Lincoln's birthday, and then we had Washington's birthday. They've since been combined into one, and Lincoln and Washington have been removed, and now we celebrate James A. Garfield, who did squat. You know, William Benjamin Harrison, who was a damn fool to his inauguration, didn't wear a coat, I think it was Harrison, didn't wear a coat, caught the flu, died three weeks later. <laughs> right? He was remembered. He was remembered, yeah. But then we have FDR. We've got Truman. We've got Eisenhower. We've got JFK. We got some biggies included in there. So there aren't gold givers as there once were. What's the speaker saying? <sighs> if only we had the kinds of leaders like we had in the good old. And the word that's used for emperor is Caesar. We don't have the Caesars that we used to have. Look at the, you know, prime ministers in Rome. They ain't nothing like Caesar, okay? All this noble host is fallen. Their happiness lost. The weaker ones remain and rule the world, laboring and toiling. What do we still hear about today? You know, partially because of some films that have come out in the last 10, 15 years, some TV series that have come out in the last 10, 15 years, HBO, the Ballet of Them, and some books that have come out in the last 10, 15 years, celebrating a generation of young men who climbed some cliffs. The cliffs of Normandy. The storming of D-Day. That those individuals... And the people back home who kept the war effort going are called what? The greatest generation. Greatest generation says what about my generation and your generation? Inferior. Not the greatest. Okay. Why, why did, were they given that phrase? Selfless acts. 17-year-old farm boys climbing cliffs being shot at. 18 year old farm boys walking over their dead buddies' bodies in the water just to get to the shore okay, while dodging bullets, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the idea this speaker is getting at. But he's not talking about modern soldiers, he's talking about soldiers of his period. And who remains? The old English there that is translated weaker, if I remember correctly. Worser. Worser. We're worse <laughs> than our parents and grandparents, great grandparents, possibly. Okay? And we're the ones who rule the world. That's a scary thought. Laboring and toiling. Joy is laid low. The earth's nobility grows old and withers. Now, nobility might mean like what we think of as nobility. We don't have nobility in the United States. Not really. you got to go to England or Sweden for real nobility. 
Who's the nobility in England? Queen Elizabeth. She's like older and dirt. <laughs> Her husband, Prince Philip, who just rolled a Land Rover last week. I didn't even know the guy was still driving. I mean, he's like 94, 95. Okay. 97? Sheesh. Prince Charles. Prince. Prince. He's like 77 years old. You shouldn't be called Prince anymore when you're that old. Just call him Chuck. <laughs> okay? The nobility does what? Grows old and withers. So what happens when something withers? It loses its strength, its vitality, its function. Like every man throughout Middle Earth. Remember what I said that J.R.R. Tolkien said all of Anglo-Saxon literature is about? The death of man and his works. Humanity and his works. Tolkien was a sexist if you want. So, old age overtakes him, his face grows pale, the gray beard grieves, he knows his old friends, offspring of princes, have given up, been given up to the earth. This is why I think Jeff Bezos is out of his mind crazy. Why would you want to live forever when everybody around you just dies? There's a great, there weren't many, there's a great X-Files episode about a guy who was immortal. <laughs> And he wanted to die. Why? Because all of his friends and all of his family kept dying. And he couldn't die. He wanted to stop. And he couldn't. When his life fails him, his fleshly cloak will neither taste the sweet, nor touch the sore, nor move a hand, nor think with his mind. Though a brother may wish to... Now, we'll stop there. We've got two minutes left, and there's two this parts too, too good to try to go over. So we'll finish this and then do Dream of the Root on Tuesday.